I'm going to call the meeting to order. Just as a reminder to everybody, if you'd like to speak before the council tonight, please complete a blue speaker request form and give it to the clerk prior to the item being presented. Roll call. Councilmember Plot Here. Councilmember Rigby? Here. Councilmember Rush? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Larimore? Here. Mayor Tesari? Here. Tonight's invocation will be presented by Father Patrick Kirsch of Blessed Father Romero Catholic Church. Is he here? We have a volunteer. All right. All right. All right. Todd. Councilman Rigby. Stand up. Our dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for this opportunity we have to gather together as a community and to discuss the needs of our community. Father, we ask that uh, we may be led and directed to say and do those things to help be continue to better our community. Father, we are grateful for our residents that come out and to, for their support and for their input. We ask that uh, a special blessing be upon our first responders in our area, that they may be protected in all that they do that they may be watched over and they may be able to return home to their families. We are grateful for them and for their service. Father, we ask for thy help in, in all that we do, and that when the time comes, we may all travel home in safety. And we ask for these things in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Councilman Rigby. Our new addition, Oscar, our student liaison, is going to lead us in the pledge. on to item three and uh, the California Department of Education created a gold ribbon schools award to honor public schools while the California distinguished schools program was on hiatus as California continued its transition to the new assessment and accountability systems criteria include academic improvement in math and English language arts test scores and schools were also evaluated on their implementation of programs and curriculum that prepare students for college and beyond. A total of 477 middle schools and high schools applied this year, and of those 477, three Eastvale schools were selected. Congratulations. That's right. <clears throat> so it's a congratulations to Eleanor Roosevelt High School, the recipient of the Gold Ribbon Award in 2016, and to River Heights Intermediate School, and Dr. Augustine Ramirez Intermediate School, who were recipients of the award in 2017. So I'd like to uh, invite our representatives from the district up to the uh, podium and the council. transition ninth grade program which is to help our ninth grade students transition from middle school to high school and that's implementing a course called success for high school as well as link crew and, and some mentorship for our students so we are very thankful uh, for the success of that program 
but also we're very thankful for the city of Eastville for your continued support in everything we do from our you know basketball you know victory parade to graduation and the help with uh, um, traffic and just everything that we do we really could not have done without the support from the city of Eastville so thank you very much at the mirrors we actually wrote our gold ribbon award for some of the systems that we have in place to make sure students get their work completed as well as the writing that's been implemented across all the curriculum. So if you have a student at Ramirez Intermediate, they will be writing even a PE, right? <laughs> Just be there too. Um, and same as Kim, we really appreciate all the support. I've worked actually as, as an administrator in Eastville for 10 years, and there's nothing like the support of Eastville City School for the schools in, in Eastville. We really appreciate all that you do for us. about our community is the great work and relationships that we have with our, with our agencies. So on behalf of the city, we'd like to recognize you guys and your achievements. Thank you guys very much. All right, we'll move on to item four, Oscar Zuniga, student liaison report. Thank you. Good evening. Ronald Reagan Elementary is having their end of the year awards assembly honoring their students on Wednesday, June 21st. Their sixth grade promotion ceremony will occur on Thursday, June, 20, June 22nd, right before the sixth grade versus softball versus staff softball game that will take place on Friday, June 23rd. As for the upcoming dates of June 26th through the 30th, there will be no, no school for the students. July 6th marks the first day back for teachers. Tracks A, C, and D will begin a new school year July 11th. Eastville Elementary will be hosting their end of the year awards for all tracks, kinder promotion for all tracks, and their sixth grade promotion through the week of June 19th through the 23rd. The school year of 2016 through the 2017th will end with a minimum day for all students. Students will begin 20 the school year of 2017 through the 2018 on Tuesday, July 11th. River Heights Intermediate is currently on summer break, but they look forward to welcoming their incoming seventh grade at their web orientation on Thursday, August 3rd. Eleanor Roosevelt High School's dual, dual immersion program will welcome their incoming freshmen who are enrolled in dual language immersion program on Tuesday, June 13th, providing orientation and food. Eleanor Roosevelt is currently hosting their annual summer camp for students who whom are part of freshman, sophomore, and junior and senior class councils, as well as their Eleanor Roosevelt Associate Student Body. All programs are currently planning for the upcoming school year of 2017-2018, which begins on Wednesday, August 9th. Any questions? 
No, thank you, Oscar. Thank you for your time. Anybody? <clears throat> we'll move on to item five, public comments. Uh, just so everybody's aware, any member of the public can address the council on items within the council's subject matter jurisdiction, so anything that's on the agenda. Um, and anything that's not on the agenda, just uh, be advised. However, we will not be able to take any action on anything that's uh, brought up not on the agenda. So if you haven't filled out a blue speaker card and you intend to speak, please uh, fill one out and present it to the city clerk. Do we our have any first, speaker cards? Our first comment card is uh, Rita Nelson. Meetings. We, record, we, we do record the meetings. Thank you. My name is Rita Nelson, N-E-L-S-E-N. I'm a resident of the city of East Hill. I'm also a resident for the city of Ontario because I'm the Parks and Rec Commissioner for 27 years. Um, I was here for the incorporation. I've been here from the very beginning. I live in District 2 and Mayor, Councilperson Michelle Cataro, um, Stephen Adams. Love my city of Eastdale. And Joe, you know that. I love my city of Eastdale. And uh, it's been a very hard thing to do. Uh, I live in two homes. I live in Eastdale on the weekend, and I live in Ontario because I must live in the city which I have jurisdiction to be a councilor, be a commissioner. Um, it's, very, it's been very difficult for me because I come back on the weekend to see my home, do the live the garden. We're right there at uh, Ronald Reagan Elementary School. I love my Ronald Reagan. And I'm very close to the teachers and the principals there. We're in the, we're in the Standard Pacific Home, so I'm trying to give you the district of where we're located because it's important. <coughs> when I talk about the issue, you know, where am I located? I mean, your district, am I correct? Mm, yes. Um, I have been involved in my neighborhood because I'm so close to all the young kids and, and the parents there. We all moved in about the same time in 2008. Thank you. We Mayor. will, someone will reach out to you. Thank you. Mayor, if, if I may, just real quick. Yes, please. There is a, uh, we did set up a, um, a committee that this issue is one of the, the items that this committee focuses on, and there will be an update toward, at the end of the meeting, the end of the city council during our council comments regarding this specific issue. Thank you so much. That's all I want to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have any more speaker cards? Okay. Ma'am. We, we do have a code enforcement officer right right behind you. 
Um, if you could please uh, speak. Yes, ma'am. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to the consent calendar. Uh, has any staff member or anyone else uh, asked for anything to be pulled? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. We had uh, Ray Hernandez asked to pull 6.4. Mr. Mayor, I would also like to pull item 6.6 .6 for discussion. I have a few questions and I would move the balance if that's appropriate. Yes, sir. So 6.4 and 6.6. 6. <coughs> All right. So uh, let's see. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the rest of it. So moved. Second. Councilmember Plot. Yes. Councilmember Rigby. Yes. Councilmember Rush. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lorimore. Aye. Mayor Tassari. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Go ahead and go to 6 4. Where are we going to do that? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Ray Hernandez has asked to pull 6.4 and address public comments. Okay. Uh, just for the record, uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, staff. Uh, just for the record, did you approve 6.4? No. You have? Okay, you still have to vote up. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ray Hernandez. I live on uh, Dearborn Street. Uh, at the last council meeting, there was a great amount of time focused on how accommodating and donated time, donated time this council extends to the public. This should not be the basis on how to review policy. It's all based on discretion with no written policy existing. We know how generous uh, our mere Joe Tassari is. I love you, Joe. However, the public time extensions will not ensure future mayors will follow in your footsteps. Little was discussed on what would be better for the public. With one exception, Councilman Bradley Plott did make comment to support the public using the term, it could be challenging with 22 minutes to address issues. I rest my case with uh, the public speaker. He also felt it was important to agendize this uh, subject matter, and thank you, uh, Mayor Tarasi, for backing that up. Clearly, the average is three minutes of public non-agendized commentary. I have surveyed, surveyed over 30 surrounding municipalities, finding none limited to a two-minute time frame. Averages are the barometers of measurement. With that said, then it's safe and fair to say Eastville currently rates a D when it comes to extending time to the public. It's below average in public commentary time standards. Donated time cannot be the excuse especially when no written policy to support this practice exists. When time is limited, we the people are denied the opportunity to explain concerns. There are, this is a great way to avoid accountability, but a poor way to govern. Without clear meaningful communication, nothing gets done effectively. I'll end this soon. One of the functions of the city attorney is to advise the city council of legal aspects, certain actions or inactions, including those related to the Brown Act. I want to thank the city attorney at the last council meeting, explaining the difference between public commentary time and agendized time. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney, for educating the city council on protocols affecting time limits and how they apply. I urge you tonight to approve the consent calendar uh, point six, uh, six point four. It's the right, right thing to do for the people and the right time to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hernandez. Any others? Can I get a motion? I would move 6.4. Second. Councilmember Plot? Yes. Councilmember Rigby? Aye. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Larmore? Aye. Mayor Tassari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. All right, uh, we'll move on to 6 6. Do we have any uh, public comments? We received none. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to ask if staff could give us an update on the scheduling um, for the property acquisition. My understanding was it was nearly done or almost complete. What does this resolution do? And 
given SB1 and SB132, um, what are we doing with the county to work with their overall accelerated timelines? <coughs> funding. If the project is not completed by 2023, we will lose funding. But what's interesting about this is the Hamner Avenue Bridge, uh, it needs to commence almost immediately after this is open for them to be completed by 2023. So it's kind of a chain reaction that's happening here. So this project is being accelerated. They're having regular meetings. Uh, the critical path, as far as the timeline is concerned, is uh, obtaining right away and also uh, a utility agreement. I appreciate that. Um, on the, the TCEs, you kind of answered the question. We anticipate bidding, you said bidding in, in January and starting construction. May or June. May or June. So we'll be paying on those TCEs from the time that the right of way certification is done to May. Is that about? As soon as offers are accepted, they will offers are accepted. Make, make payment. Okay. Uh, initially, the temporary consideration easements, they will pay for. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I would move approval of this item. Second. Councilmember Platt? Yes. Councilmember Rigby? Yes. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Lormore? Aye. Mayor Tesari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. We'll go ahead and move on to item 7 public hearings. <clears throat> uh, 7.1 is a public hearing item to review the Burtec Waste Industries 2017 18 rate increase request. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the City Council. The item before you is a recommendation to approve the rate increase for Burtec for the fiscal year 1718. Um, as you can see in the index calculation, uh, the rate increase approximates a 1.77 overall rate increase, which is attributed to an increase in the consumer price index, uh, which has gone up 1.89% and the disposal green waste processing rate, which is out of the Agua Mansa uh, landfill, which is the unincorporated Rubidoux area, um, has gone up 1.54% um, for the aggregate total of 1.77%. Uh, so the recommendation by staff is to approve the rate increase for fiscal year 17 and 18. Um, and just for the public's <coughs> knowledge, this rate increase applies to everything in the city of Eastvale north of Belgrave, which is uh, commercial and industrial properties only, uh, consisting of no residential areas. I do have Mr. Mike Aragon, the Vice President of Burtec, available and myself available to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions? I'll entertain a motion. Mr. Mayor, if you oh, can open have, the oh, public I'm hearing. sorry. <laughs> do we have any speaker cards? We have none. We'll go ahead and close the public hearing on that. No, we don't want to close the public hearing yet. P public comment. Yeah. Sorry. I'd like to make a motion to approve this as stated. Second. Councilmember Platt? Yes. Councilmember Rigby? Yes. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Lorimar? Aye. Mayor Tesari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. All right, we'll move on to item 8 City Council business. 
8.1 budget study session for the annual operations and capital improvement budget fiscal year 2017-18 draft. Good evening, Mayor Tassari and council members. This is the third budget workshop study session that the city has held. The first one being March 23rd, we discuss some historical trends, forecasts, um, we discussed council goals and priorities. The second one was held April 12th, which discussed the uh, public safety contracts and service uh, for fire and police. Uh, today, our goal um, is to go over our current fiscal situation, estimated revenues, proposed expenditures, we'll go over capital improvements, some forecasts, and um, discussion and questions regarding some of your goals and priorities for this this upcoming budget year. This, I just want to reiterate, we are still in a draft format. This is um, a proposed draft. We will plan to bring back the um, proposed adopted budget next council meeting in, on June 28th. Um, and there will be changes um, depending on what your priorities and goals and um, questions are. Uh, so this is a guideline, and again, it is a draft, and it will change. So what, why do we have a budget? It is basically a blueprint for providing services to the community, uh, residents, and constituents. It's a financial plan for the year, and it matches the available resources. All the revenues we have, we need to see how, many re how much revenues we have so we can meet the community needs through our operating and capital expenditures. We have several practices that we use when we do the budget. The first being we try to be as conservative as we can within our means. We want to balance the general fund budget so revenues do equal expenditures. We, we don't want to pull from reserves when we do this balance. So whatever revenues we have, we don't want to exceed that with our expenditures. We try to build in contingencies. These are somewhat of cushions. So if events happen during the year, we have a little bit excess. So we don't have to pull from those reserves. And we also want to look into investing in the future to try to think long term uh, for some of the projects, uh, build out, and so forth. So before we go into the current budget, we want to look at our current fiscal, fiscal situation and talk about some of the reserves that we have. Before you see a, a trend, we've had the red line is the um, historical revenue. So we've seen it go up and up and up every year, and it's starting to flatten out. Um, the blue bars are the expenditures. So we've always exceeded, the revenues have always exceeded expenditures. So every excess we have year over year adds to our reserves. As you can see in 2017, uh, we had the expenditures go up quite a bit. This is due um, partially to the increase in the patrol hours for police up to 90 hours um, a day, and also due to the uh, building, the construction of the, the new second fire station. So it did increase quite a bit, and we see that we are hitting break even for um, estimated 2017. So as I mentioned, we've always exceeded, or revenues have always exceeded, exceeded expenditures, which have added to our reserves. Well, what do reserves mean? We, um, there's three categories, and this is according to GASB, uh, generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, restricted is legally required. An example would be fire fund. We cannot spend anything uh, from fire revenues other than for fire services. Committed is generally something internally imposed by council by resolution. So we have committed in prior years $3 million to the construction of the Civic Center, future Civic Center, and that was through a council action in prior years. Assigned is an earmarked item, so we would earmark, earmark that for a specific purpose, um, which could be, for example, economic development. So our estimated reserves as of July 1, so coming up in a couple weeks, after continuing appropriations is roughly 24.4 million. And that's a huge accomplishment. I just want to congratulate the council and staff 
for being conservative and being fiscally minded in order to essentially save that amount of money in the, the last um, six years or so of incorporation. But not all of that is available. 50% of our expenditures are committed for emergency contingency, which is generally six months of operation. So that is $7.8 million. As I mentioned before, the Civic Center is committed for $3 million. And our fire operations is restricted. So of that 24.4 million, 4.2 of that is restricted for fire operations. So as you can see, just over 15 million is committed or reserved. And what's left over is just over $9 million um, available. And this reiterates what I, we've just discussed as far as the trends. So again, we're about 24.4 million. And you can see on that last bar, the, the highlighted um, sections, again, 7 million for, that should be um, rainy day contingency, uh, 3 million for Civic Center, and then about 4.2 for fire. And again, the, the remaining available is just over 9 million. So some be best practices for using those reserves. We generally don't want to use that for uh, ongoing operations. Um, if you can equate that to borrowing, we don't want to borrow against ourselves for ongoing operations. So if you were, for example, to purchase a car um, from your savings account, that's unsustainable. You're, you're going to run out of money it's, instead of using it from your resources or continuing revenues. Um, unassigned re reserves is sort of a savings account of sorts. You want to save for the future. Um, generally, we use those reserves for one-time purchases or uh, capital items, and also for stabilization for f future economic uncertainties. Nobody can predict the future, but it's nice to have that cushion in case something um, there is a downturn in the economy. So now that we've talked about reserves, I want to go into the estimated revenues for the upcoming year. We've estimated revenues for all funds, restricted and general, for uh, $27.6 million. Of those revenues, 55% of that is general fund. All the other uses are restricted. Going into more detail from the general fund, which is about $20.5 million, you can see the breakdown of, of the resources we have. Um, the majority comes from sales and use tax and property tax. Other sources of revenue are licenses, uh, franchise fees, uh, penalties and forfeitures, and other. Because the majority is sales tax, we want to understand that a little bit better and where it comes from. 36% uh, of the general fund revenues come from sales tax, which uh, the, the sales tax rate in Eastville is 7.75. But not all of that goes to Eastville. Four cents of that goes to the state of California, two and a fourth goes to Riverside County, and then Eastville collects one and a half percent. That half percent is restricted for transportation uses and cannot be used for a general fund. The other largest source of revenue is property tax. Um, our base property tax rate is 1% of the home's value. So of every dollar paid in property tax, we get about um, one cent of that. And then you can see the breakdown. Most of it goes to schools, the county, um, education, and so forth. Um, part of that is restricted for fire services, um, so if you break down that one cent, 0 0.063 cents goes to the city for fire services. So this is the um, sources, the revenues in dollar amounts, and we'll go into each of these individual line items separately. Um, I just want to point you to the totals. Um, so our budgeted for the 16-17 the year it was 14.2 million. And we are estimating in the new budget year, 17-18, uh, 15.7 million. Now, it seems like a large increase, but in prior years we were able to, to budget very conservatively, estimate our revenues a little bit lower to give ourselves a little bit more cushion. 
This year, things are tightening up, so we want it to be more realistic. If you can see that white line at the very bottom, the actual general fund revenues are estimated for this current fiscal year about 15.3. So as I mentioned before, it is definitely flattening out. We're not going to see that increase that we've seen in prior years. Also, I want to point out the second to the bottom line. This is a new item. It's called a cost allocation plan. Uh, we have not had this previously, but we needed to close a budget gap. And this is pretty standard in other um, jurisdictions where we have indirect costs. And, and actually, we'll talk about that right now. Um, we have indirect costs uh, throughout the city, such as um, administration, insurance, um, building and maintenance. Um, that is, in other cities, spread out over non-general fund sources, for example, gas tax, measure A, AQMD. We have not done that um, in prior years, um, but we will, um, we propose to do it this year in the, in the new budget year to spread those indirect costs out through the citywide services. So to go into more detail, we'll start with property tax. Um, it, we anticipate that it will continue to grow at a steady pace because of construction and property sales. However, we did want to be a little more conservative using the California Consumer Price Index of 2%. So you'll see that increases exactly 2%. Sales and use tax, again, is the, one of the bigger revenue sources. Um, we use HGL as our sales tax and property tax consultant. We have based our estimates on their um, analysis and expertise. Um, they have relayed to us that sales continue to move in a positive direction. Um, we've had a lot of economic development and construction of commercial sites. So we anticipate um, about a $7.3 million um, revenue for sales tax. And you can see at the bottom that we're, we're estimating the actual for this year at 7.1. So again, we're flattening out. Franchise tax, we looked at historical trends, and this year our uh, Southern California gas remittance was quite lower than it has been in previous years, and we are researching why that is. Uh, but we are planning to revisit franchise agreements with waste management to look at the rates we charge and compare it with other cities, um, and we're in the process of doing that right now. So we hope to perhaps bring that back mid-year uh, with higher estimates. Licenses and fees, we're anticipating a growth of 7%. Um, development growth continues. And again, once we have the build, up, build out of the city, that may decline in future years. Um, all of those growths are offset by, by the expenditures for those development services. Uh, fines and penalties, we've... Uh, implemented several programs within the city. We've in implemented third-party collections which have increased our revenues in that area. We've purchased electronic citation devices for better efficiency. And we've employed a part-time dedicated street sweeping employment officer. So as a result, we've seen an increase in those um, citations and um, compliance. Lastly, we have a huge jump in the intergovernmental and other revenue. Uh, there's several reasons for this. The first being we've uh, participated in the abandoned vehicle abatement program with Riverside County. We've in contracted with an investment advisor to more than triple our investment revenue. And we are proposing to implement a passport acceptance facility at City Hall, which should bring in, um, we're estimating about 100,000 uh, for that service. So now that we know what our resources are, we can go to our expenditures. As you can see, the majority of our expenditures are for operations. This will include fire and police. Our personnel are just our in-house staff. And as you know, uh, most of our, our services are provided by contract staff. Um, so that the contract staff will be included in operations. Uh, personnel, again, is just the employed um, staff 
which is, represents only 5% of expenditures. And a capital outlay, uh, that includes Measure A, gas tax, all the streets, highways, um, all of those expenditures are included in capital outlay. This is the same information presented in numbers form. Um, so you can see the change from year to year. Our personnel, we're proposing an increase of 258,000 um, and we'll go over why that is in the next slide. Our operations, our um, proposed increase is 1.1 million. Capital outlay is uh, proposed uh, 68, almost 69,000 for a total increase of 1.4 million or 10%. And I just want to reiterate that our expenditures, our proposed expenditures, do equal our revenue, so we will have a balanced budget. Okay, Mr. Mayor, mind if I make a comment? Councilman Platt. I noticed on our total expenditures, uh, we're at, on the, on the graph, it's at 33 million, but our estimated revenues are at 27 million, but yet we're supposed to have a wash. Is there something I'm missing on that? Yes, when we go to the general fund expenditures, we want a balanced budget on general expenditures. Um, but when we look at these total expenditures for all funds, it includes all of our restricted funds, such as gas tax measure eight. We have several, a lot of reserves in those funds, which we're using for capital items. So you're gonna see uh, for all funds, a higher expenditure than you will revenue just so like, because we're using those reserves. So I'm maybe jumping ahead of the boat, I apologize. So like for the measure A or AQMD or something, you know, uh, those funds we might see a higher expenditure versus the revenues. Correct. Okay. Sorry, and again, because we will be using those reserves, which they are for capital expenditures. Thank you. So our proposed personnel increase is $259,000. Some of the reasons for this we're proposing um, is adding a second code enforcement officer for a two um, code enforcement officer model. Um, and also increasing our street sweeping officer from a half um, full-time equivalent to 0.75. So that net increase equals um, $116,000. And we have some offsets in code enforcement to mitigate that increase, which we'll talk about in operations, part of that being uh, reducing some administrative costs. The second reason being we want to classify an office assistant to deputy city clerk, and there's um, other changes in city clerk office that were approved um, in this fiscal year for a net de decrease of almost $11,000. Um, and I want to point out that we've, we've been in the process of doing a job, um, a job study um, to look at what our staff are actually doing compared to what their, their titles are and what their classifications are. And we're, we're still in the process of doing that as well as um, looking at salary surveys with other cities. So there may be some changes we bring back to you in the next meeting for personnel, but these are proposed as of the, this draft date. Um, the other change is we are taking on more uh, human resources and moving that um, to the management analyst position. But in order to um, backfill some of the finance um, duties, we are proposing an additional position to backfill that. Um, absence of the management analyst in finance uh, with a senior account clerk. We are also looking at revising the salary range, but the net effect of that um, is roughly $93,000. The other minor change is to propose to change bilingual pay from 5% of pay to a flat rate of $100 a month. And that's uh, based on some comparisons with other jurisdictions. So this is a breakdown of the general fund and fire fund. As you can see, uh, the majority goes to law enforcement, fire, and community development. Our total uses for general fund and fire is $20.7 million. And you can see 60%, 67% of the general fund and fire goes to public safety. So I wanted to show this in numbers as well, um, and I want to break it down uh, by administration, community development, and public safety. 
So the first thing, administration. This is all of your city council, city attorney, city clerk, city manager, finance, and building and, building and facilities and so forth. This is generally not cost recovery. Um, it's de departments and divisions that serve an administrative function. So you can see the total increase for these administrative departments is almost $300,000 or 11%. And I'll highlight some of the major differences um, for each of these uh, divisions. So for our city council, there's a 10% increase for 27,000. This is due um, by including health benefits for all council members, although uh, the majority don't use the entire allotted amount, we still want to budget for that in case um, it will be used. And anything that's not used, um, including um, some budgeted positions will be, be a contingency. Um, so it'll be more of a cushion. Um, whatever's not used will just go towards that cushion or contingency for unforeseen events this being one of them. The city clerk um, is a decrease of roughly 68,000 and this is due to um, a non-election year. Every two years an election is held so you're gonna see a fluctuation from year to year in that department. The city manager department increased about 33,000 or 4%. Um, as discussed, we are reallocating the management analyst position to the city manager's office for human resources and that is that increase is being offset by eliminating the grant writer consultant. However, we can employ the grant writer consultant as on an as needed basis should we choose to do that if we um, see a grant we'd like to pursue. We can consult individually instead of a retainer. In finance, uh, we're seeing an increase of roughly $92,000 or 16%. This is not due to any um, increase in services. Previously, we have excluded property tax administrative charges, sales and property tax audit costs as an expense because we've netted it against revenue. However, that is not compliant with GAAP, so we want to make sure we, we've itemized those costs in our expenditures. As a result, you'll see that increase, however, services have not changed, so it's more of a compliance issue versus a s increasing services. General government has increased uh, roughly 61%. This is a large increase, however, um, it's due mostly to a line item contingency amount in order to balance the budget. Last year, or actually in this current year, 1617, we have used um, $212,000 in contingency for un un unforeseen events. So again, that cushion comes in handy throughout the year so we don't have to pull from reserves or um, exceed our resources. So that's why you'll see the big difference. Um, it's not, um, other than the city hall lease, increasing, there's no um, increase in services to this, this department. So we've talked about administration, I wanna move on to community development. This will include your um, building and safety, your engineering, planning departments, as well as code enforcement. So the bottom line increase for community development is $340,000 or 11%. For individual divisions or departments, um, I want to go over significant increases again. In planning department, we are expecting an increase of $100,000 or 13%. And this is um, due to anticipated projects throughout the year, including the sign code, civic center, landscaping, zoning code, and uh, the remainder of the Lille project. So those are specific projects that we're anticipating for this coming year. Uh, the building and safety department, we anticipate an increase of 14%. Um, however, this increase is going to be offset by licensing revenue, development revenue that, that will offset that cost increase. Code enforcement, we had mentioned uh, moving to a two officer model um, and increasing the full-time equivalents for street sweeping enforcement. 
Um, we anticipate the Street Sweeping Enforcement Officer will supplement some of those administrative duties and also um, we are re proposing to reduce some of the administration um, to be handled by the officers themselves. Mr. Mayor, question on, Rush. thank you. Question on code enforcement. Um, I don't see on your PowerPoint here our, our cost recovery as small as it is with respect to code enforcement. What is our anticipated um, fines and, and fees and administrative citations and all that associated with code through the settlements that we're getting? Do we have a number for that? That's a good question. In our budget document, in our draft document, on each of the department summaries, we show a contributing revenue line item. So for each, um, each of these administrative or community development um, areas within the city, we show what revenues each department is bringing in. For the code enforcement, we anticipate about 460,000 um, in contributing revenue for um, a budget of 490. So they are almost a full cost recovery. Their revenues include um, fines and fees for parking, for municipal code, and for foreclosure property registration. I see that. Thank you. So the next area is public safety. This is the biggest increase of 556,000 or 15%. And I will, um, public safety includes the law enforcement, co animal control, crossing guards, and a separate line of fire department. We, we do that separately because they receive their fire tax separately from the general fund revenues. So in police department, we are not proposing an increase in patrol hours due to the cost of that increase. However, we do show an increase of 805,000. That is just for um, the contract rate increase. There is no change in the patrol hours that we're proposing for this budget year. Um, the total that we have um, for this budget year and that we're proposing for next year is 90 hours a day. However, we do have dedicated positions, as you can see there, uh, two zone deputies, a motor officer, two traffic officers, two CSOs. Mr. Mayor, if I may, I have a question on the public safety, uh, the police department. Do we utilize any reserve officers and does that affect our budget also, do you know? Uh, the Rupa Station does have reserve officers. I want to say that we have three or four, and that does not impact the uh, contract rate at all. Okay. And are they utilized here? Are they assigned certain areas, or they're assigned throughout the uh, Rupa Valley Station jurisdictions? So they're between East Bell, Rupa, and Norco. So there's um, some line items that we discussed in our previous um, budget sessions. Um, to add 10 hours of patrol hours per day is roughly $690,000. So on top of the contract rate increase of 800,000, you would have an additional 690,000. And that's just for your information. Um, however, to fund that, you would need to find the resources to, to, to do so or dip into your reserves. Um, so that's something that um, staff has discussed, possibly bringing back at mid-year, depending on our economic developments or some of the revenues we're seeing from the state, depending on the timing of that. So it's, it's not off the table, but we're not proposing any increase for this, this year. Um, in addition to that, um, adding a motor officer is about $390,000. And to do both uh, 10 hours and a motor officer on top of the rate increase would be about 1.9 million dollars to do the additional 10 hours a rate increase and a motor officer just for your information and how, about how much do we i guess i do the math can you go back to the uh the annual okay so 
How much are we paying per? Oh, geez. How much are we paying per month? Need a calculator to do that. Do a quick math. Um, well, right now our budget is um, seven point nine, almost eight million dollars so for the year. So with no increases, we're paying about seven hundred thirty thousand dollars per month. Roughly. Correct. Okay. Based on the invoices, it's roughly. Uh, just for the straight patrol hours, it's roughly about $550,000 a month. And then we get a separate invoice, excuse me, for any overtime um, or um, a supplemental charges like the, uh, the uh, RCIT for the motor officer and, and things like that. Okay. So adding that all together, you're looking currently, current budget year, um, it's about almost six hundred thousand dollars a month in law enforcement, okay. not including their projected increase for next fiscal year. So we're also seeing an increase in our fire department expenditures, and this is due to a contract rate increase as well of 7%. In addition, because we have um, built the second fire station, we need to staff it. For this current year, we've staffed it for half a year. I believe it was opened in February, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but we need to budget for the 17, 18 year for an entire year. So this includes staffing, it includes maintenance, it includes utilities, and all those things that come with having a second station. The optional cost to staff the medic engine, as we discussed in the public safety meeting in April, is uh, roughly $666,000. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, we are limited to um, our resources of a property tax. Anything exceeding our property tax will have to be pulled from the general fund to supplement those services. Um, this is the, the slide I discussed as far as the um, adding the 10 patrol hours, the motor officer, or doing all of the above. So you'll see the line item increase, and then if you want to do a combination of any of those, you'll see the total increase on the right. And again, we can reevaluate that at mid-year depending on our um, resources from the state and economic development and how that's doing. Just want to point out a few capital improvement highlights, and then um, after my presentation, I'll turn it over to Joe to go in more detail for capital projects. Uh, some of the highlights for completed projects are the fire station again, um, bids for Hamner Avenue rehabilitation, for bids for county flood control. We've completed the radar speed displayed signs and storm drain at, at the new fire station on Chandler and Selby. Some priorities for the year are the overlay of residential streets, arch ball widening, um, some other storm drains, and purchasing the property for the future Civic Center. Among, um, and the, there's also some other projects that Joe will discuss. So Public Works has been very busy. So we've looked at our proposed budget and estimated revenues. However, we like to forecast for the next five years to see where we're, we're sitting and what we can look for in the future and set some priorities and goals. Um, we see where, where you see the arrows. Again, we had the increase of patrol hours and fire station construction, so you'll see um, a lot more um, expenditures in those two years, a big jump. However, we're seeing because of the um, increase in the contract rate for public safety, and some other issues that we're seeing an increase um, in the, the forecast for expenditures ongoing. However, again, the revenues are flattening out, so we're, we're looking at a break-even point in 2020. And beyond that, we need to look for other resources or reduce expenditures somehow um, to, to have that balanced budget. Before you move on, I have a, a couple of questions. On the, the journal fund expenditures, I think you had mentioned, it's not in the package here, but our actuals for this fiscal year are 15.1 million, give or take, um, which is about $900,000 more than anticipated. 
how do we reconcile though? Things are flattening out, sales tax revenues flattening out, yet I think on the proposed budget for the next year, we're about $500,000 over what our actuals are for this year. And I also saw um, a, an estimate for the planning department, 700 and some odd thousand, where that's over our actuals for this year. For this year. So on one hand, things are slowing down, but yet we're anticipating and budgeting for uh, increased revenues from those two aspects. Well, well, that is the challenge. Um, we're seeing um, services aren't slowing down. The city is still as active as ever. So we need to provide those services. Um, however, um, to balance the budget, we need to find additional resources to cover those costs. Um, so that that is the challenge that we're facing. And a lot of um, other cities, jurisdictions, counties are also facing um, budget deficits and trying to find ways to reduce that deficit. So uh, um, in a later slide, we, I mean, the, that's what we need from council is some direction on um, how we do that or at least try to plan for those, those deficits in future years. And I know we're putting a lot of efforts into economic development and Michelle can attest to that a little bit more if she chooses to. Um, and eventually, again, the city's gonna be built out, so some of those those services will eventually reduce, mm -hmm. especially in community development. We're not gonna see as high of um, expenditures in community development. So I don't really have an a, a specific answer to that, um, other than we just need to plan for it and anticipate it and, and work around it and um, Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, the additional 10 hours for law enforcement, wh what's the cost of that specifically? No, we had it in the last budget, and I didn't see it in here. Just the just the ten hours is uh, six hundred and eighty nine thousand dollars approximately. Okay, okay, thank you. And to to speak to um, some of uh, Anna's points on the economic development side, the projections on sales tax revenue do not include anything that is currently under construction. So there, there are projects that are coming online that um, I have projections on what kind of sales tax production they would deliver to the city based on the square footage. But uh, again, we take a very conservative approach and we do not uh, count our chickens before they hatch. So that's not included in these <coughs> revenue uh, projections for coming fiscal year. And on top of that, sales tax is always trailing so, um, you know, it's trailing about a quarter. So, so there's a three to six month delay on sales tax. Mr. Mayor, sales tax is so just to clarify on my, my, uh, my part for me. So these projections here do not include anything like Costco coming in or Walmart or anything like that. That's, That's correct. correct. Yeah, this is just status quo. Uh, we don't, like Michelle said, we try to underestimate and overperform. So we know those things are down the pipeline, but we don't want to, um, again, count our chickens before they hatch. We don't want to anticipate that revenue. It should something happen to not have that revenue come in. Yeah, nor does it include any of the future revenue from the recent legislation. That's correct. correct. We, we had discussed this kind of at staff level and with the uh, finance committee, which consists of uh, Mayor Tesseri and uh, Councilmember Plot, that because of SB 130, yes, we will see um, some reallocation of VLF dollars, which we, had, we do have a slide here, which is uh, $66.87 per capita. But according to uh, Sacramento, we won't see our first payment until May of 2018. And that, that being the case and not, not having, um, I mean, that's the end of next fiscal year. So we don't feel it's prudent to include that information into our current budget season. If it should come early, then, then we can yes, revisit that. that. Exactly, and that is what, what we're proposing, that we, that, um, that does not mean, you know, adding 10 hours from the sheriff's, for Sheriff's Department services is completely off the table, but we have to see what comes in. 
We have to see the, the fruitfulness of some of these projects that are currently under, devel under development as well as the VLF money. If it drops before May 2018, that would be fantastic. But at this time, we're counting on what we know for sure, and that data comes from HDL based on the businesses that currently exist here in the city of Eastvale and are reporting um, sales tax revenue to the State Board of Equalization. Thank you, Michelle. Go ahead. Do you have one question? Yeah, I do. Go ahead, Councilman Plot. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In regards to SP 130 and getting that funding, um, that we, I mean, is this obviously if it's something that's, con that's gonna be ongoing, at least we hope it's gonna continue. I mean, are we gonna have to deal with this year in and year out that, hey, our payment's gonna be in May? If we know that it's come, I mean, I, I guess, you know, and I, I, I appreciate the conservative doom and gloom approach to the budget, but it's also, at the same time, it's, it's, if the money's going to be there and it is guaranteed, and that might be the question if it's guaranteed, but are we gonna do this next year where, hey, we're here in June, yeah, we're gonna get payment in May. I, it makes it difficult for us here to know that because yeah, we, we would love, to, I mean, for myself, I know we'd love to have more law enforcement and that's a, that is a, that's 23% of our general fund um, revenues that, that extra four or five million, whatever it ends up being. Um, but how should we start looking at this year in and year out if every time it's gonna be right at the end of our year? Uh, Councilmember Platt, that's actually a, a very, very good question. And um, in, in trying to assemble this budget and, and give the, the council some, some hard numbers, we had, I had gone back and forth with the League of California Cities and the folks in Sacramento. So this first payment is not going to hit until May of two, at the end of May 2018. Um, the VLF uh, um, dollars are tied to property taxes. So it's 60, as I, we said, $66.87 per capita. Property tax is paid in uh, April and May, and then it's um, allocated approximately 30 to 45 days afterwards. So. Moving forward, uh, we would see our first payment in May because there's the implementation of the bill and the rollout and the calculations, so it's, it's gonna be a prorated. But um, coming December of 18, everyone's gonna pay their property taxes, hopefully. And then late January, February of 19, we'd see another payment, and then you'd be on more of a cycle so that it helps. would be, you know, as I said, property tax is paid in December mm -hmm. and in April, and then you've got about 45 to 60 days afterwards that you, the money trickles down to the local level. So I hope that we, can. No, it does, and then we would have at least, we can be a little more consistent. Yes, sir. We, we'd have uh, a better, a better um, idea of what we can count on mm -hmm. and uh, a cycle that, that we can depend on. Thank you. So Council Member Rush, you had asked about some of these Excuse deficits. Me, Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, sorry. One, one question before we move mm -hmm. forward. Uh, th there was a statement made earlier that we needed to look at these financial forecasts which and be concerned about where we're going in terms of spending and how to address that. But as we've just discussed, and I realize we're being conservative, we have a number of funds that should be coming this way. Um, how, how worried do we need to be related to addressing our budget and down the line at this point? Again, that is, that's, a, that's the uh, million dollar question. Um, years down the road when the building you know, the residential developers are no longer building homes in Eastvale. All of the different commercial centers are built out. Um, it's it's going to be tight. And we're going to have to be very uh, prudent and um, conservative and aggressive in other methods. 
Um, and that's where looking at operations, trying to find uh, operational efficiencies, things like the citation, handheld citation devices, you know, all of these looking department by department to identify uh, tools that we can use to, again, do more with less. But the reality is we're already doing more with less. Um, you know, the city has grown in population since incorporation. We we're about 46 to 48,000. Now we're at over 64,000. The demands of the citizens do not decrease. Um, so we're going, yeah, yeah. The demands of the citizens don't decrease. We have to continue to deliver. And, and how we're going to do that years from now with a flattening stream of uh, revenue stream is, is going to be um, where things like a economic development action plan are, are gonna be critically important. And again, looking at from a policy level, how do you protect and strategically develop things that are going to produce the maximum return? So going back, you know, just as an example, the Lille project. Um, you know, council's vision on that was is very specific, and you took kind of, in my opinion, of, of somewhat of a proactive and protective stance in doing a strategic plan, excuse me, a specific plan over that project to make sure that certain uses come out of it that are beneficial to the citizens. You did the same thing with the Goodman Commerce Center. You demanded a certain level of services so that you can provide a sustainable future for the citizens. Um, well, we're going to need to continue that trend. And it's not going to be easy. Um, that's why you guys get the big bucks. <laughs> um, but again, I think, I think we have um, staff that, uh, that work very uh, hard and conservatively to, to provide the maximum to the citizens with the minimum. And that's appreciated. Again, these are estimates. Once consistent revenues come in, we can revise these and revisit them and change our trends depending on uh, what, what we see actually coming in versus what we think is going to come in. So the, these will change um, depending on, uh, on, like I said, historical numbers. So with that in mind, um, we do want to keep some items uh, in the forefront of our minds, uh, including public safety costs, uh, minimum wage reg regulations. Um, as the city ages, our infrastructure will also age. Michelle mentioned population growth, impacts from major development and construction of city hall. So all these things we need to keep in mind as we look towards the future. We'd mentioned recent state legis legislation and some of the, the major ones, the three major ones are SB1, which is the Road Repair Accountability Act. These are restricted funds, um, restricted to roads only, and we estimate about 1.4 million a year. However, the first payment is delayed. We anticipate it in November, um, so there will be a prorated amount for that. It won't be the full year amount. Uh, we have budgeted for this in our um, capital improvement plan, which Joe can speak to. Um, SB 130 is the vehicle license fix. We are anticipating 4.3 million a year, which will be a huge help to the city. Uh, however, like Michelle mentioned, our payment is delayed, so we don't want to um, include that in our budget uh, because we don't know the exact amount, and we, again, cross our fingers, so we'll get that in May, hopefully sooner. SB 132 is a Riverside County Transportation Efficiency Corridor funding and these are for specific projects that is um, led by the county um, including Hamner Bridge widening and the Lime Knight I-15 interchange. We will not see any of that money come to the city however we'll see the, the fruition or the results of that funding. Anna, do you mind if I, I jump in on this Please. slide? Um, so to, to go back, speaking to some of the council questions, how do, how do we plan for this in the future? Um, we are going to look at everything. There's, there's got to be no rock that is not turned over and re-examined. So um, we're currently in the process of re-examining our franchise fees. 
Um, that would be waste management. That's going to be Burtec. Um, we're we're looking at um, even our telecoms. You know, is there is there anything that we can we can do there? Um, we are going to be initiating a a fee study to recover some costs that uh, were never anticipated when we did our first fee study in 2012, um, like grow houses. Uh, that's not something that, that should be borne by the general fund. But at this current juncture, we don't have a fee schedule that, that, uh, that addresses that. And there's, there's several other components on, on our fee schedule of, of things that we staff at staff level see now that we've got some time under our belt, the city's up and functioning, and we have um, more ongoing trends and services to deliver, we, we're starting to see gaps. And so that's something that we're going to be addressing in a, in a uh, uh, fee study and cost recovery. Uh, James will be bringing a staff report to council, I, I believe, at the next is it next council meeting, or yes, at the next council meeting to get that started. Again, optimizing our economic development uh, through an economic development action plan. Um, some of the other things that council may want to consider, which are much less savory, is uh, initiating a utility users tax. A lot of other cities do that. We currently don't, which, in my opinion, is uh, an economic development tool. When I'm discussing that with uh, prospective uh, tenants for Eastvale, that that is one of those positives for Eastvale. You know, we don't have a utility users tax. Um, we don't have a business license tax. We do a business registration. These are but these are things that other cities have had to do in order to start bridging their gaps. Um, other cities in the Inland Empire this, this past election season did a sales tax initiative. Temecula, um, Riverside, Menifee, Hemet, and there's another one. They, they all initiated sales tax initiatives for, um, the, and those are ballot measures. Um, some of them were geared specifically towards public safety. Some of them were a general, a general sales tax initiative. But just to put things in perspective, you know, City of Riverside will be generating uh, three billion dollars through their sales tax initiative over a ten-year period. Um, as I said, those are much less savory alternatives, but those may be things that we need to look at in the future. Um, some of the other options are to reduce non-essential services, to reduce staffing at City Hall, to reduce public safety positions, which I don't think is, a, is an option, and uh, or exploring alternatives to public safety contracts. So just to wrap it up before we go to capital projects, uh, these are some discussion questions, um, some thought questions uh, to think about. Are we uh, meeting current service levels? Are they satisfactory? How can we bring additional revenue? These are all things that we think about when we put this budget together um, and also to discuss some of the priorities of council and the community. Um, so with that, um, if there's no other questions as far as this presentation, we'll go to capital projects and then we can discuss afterwards. Are there any additional questions on this portion of the budget? Councilman Rigby. Thank you. I have just a couple of questions. One was going back to uh, <coughs> proposed expenditures. Um, do we have any kind of uh, contract compliance that we work with with our contracts, such as like animal services, law enforcement, firefighting? Um, and I think it kind of br got brought up at the town hall meeting when a question, or public safety meeting, when it got brought up from the animal services on that we share that with another city or another uh, unincorporated area. 
and a commissioner asked about that when they leave our city, who pays for that? And he wasn't quite sure because I think sometimes, and I don't know if it happens in law enforcement or fire or what, but sometimes I guess we're allotted four hours. We don't always get that four hours. So is there a contract compliance? If so, who oversees that and how does that work? So the uh, city manager's office oversees the contracts for um, various services that we um, utilize. Um, previously, this, this discussion over can we do better at a better cost, is there a cost savings, to look at alternatives. Uh, we have looked at alternatives in the past. Uh, one of them was to contract with um, the Inland Humane Society to provide a higher level of service at the same or lower cost. Um, those are things that we have explored in the past. Contracting with the city of Norco, for example, for animal control services, that has been looked at. Um, contracting with the city of Corona has was was looked at, but at the time they Corona didn't have their new animal shelter, so that is something potentially to revisit. Again, these are all these are all things that um, that we need to go through one almost one by one and reanalyze. You know, we just got done at staff level several months of meetings and analysis to figure out if going back to the property tax role for for waste management delinquent accounts is a more cost effective means of uh, receiving our um, our franchise fee these are things that we're doing at city hall we're going to have to continue to do that and and certainly with council and commissioners input um, it's just going to be an ongoing process. You know, what may not have worked two years ago may, may work now. You know, speaking to the uh, animal control contract, I know the city of Norco has said they can't service the city of Eastfield because of the volume. They just don't have the space to accommodate our volume. Um, the the uh, Humane Society uh, the citizens really pushed back because it's 30 minutes away. It's in the city of Pomona. So, um, but you know, we'll continue to look at, at every, every contract. And, and I know that it's a lot of work, especially going through and looking at all these and, and very stressful to see, hey, where can we cut and what, what can we do? Um, I think more specifically to what I'm referring to is not, not necessarily what's in the future, but even the current where we're at, as mm -hmm. well as in the future such as, for instance, with animal control. We get four hours a day. Are we actually getting those four hours a day? Um, I know that some contract services in other jurisdictions that they do an evaluation as it gets towards the end of the month, the end of their billing cycle, and they check and they say, okay, where are we at compliance-wise? If we're supposed to have four hours a day, Monday through Friday, have we gotten that? Are we behind? Um, do we need to add eight hours to the next day? Same thing with law enforcement. Do we have anything that says, okay, 90 hours a day is what we're allotted? Um, at the end of getting close to the end of the month, we're only at, we're, we're under that. We haven't provided that many hours. Um, is there anything that's, that we look at to monitor that to make sure, to make sure that we're getting our money's worth, to make sure that we're getting what we're paying for rather than just relying on our contract is this, this is what we're paying, we're gonna trust. Are we, is there any measure that we have that's in place for that? That would be the monthly invoices. So uh, the monthly invoices come in, they're reviewed by me, then they go to the finance department, finance reviews them before they're put packaged into the warrant register, then the finance committee reviews them as well before they actually are authorized for payment and then that warrant register goes into the uh, agenda packet. So, so yes, there's, there, there are really three different groups looking at it, first city manager, then finance, then uh, the finance committee. And all um, of those invoices are itemized by hours, typically, times the contract rate, so we do see that. Todd, are you, Mr. Well, Councilman Plot, Todd, are you referring to, I mean, I, I think you're, I thought you were referring to more like GPS type stuff instead of billing. 
or is that? Yeah, not necessarily just billing, but more of making sure that that we're actually, yeah, for instance, going back to the animal services, and I think the same thing for, for law enforcement because we share the services with other jurisdictions. But similar to what Councilmember Plot was saying, almost the GPS, are we making sure rather than them just billing four hours a day, Monday through Friday, are we actually getting that? Yeah, they send a report with the invoice. Okay. There's, there's a report, the number of animals that were impounded, the number of licenses that were collected, the number of hours, the number of overtime, call outs, all, those, all of those receipts are, are uh, submitted on a monthly basis as part of their invoice. So it's not an auto pay feature, just because we have a contract, they automatically get paid a certain amount every month. No, they have to submit, and sometimes it's, sometimes it's lower than, than previous months, sometimes it's, it's over. And that's, that's where the, the budget comes into play, is to not exceed what was budgeted. Captain. But uh, we know that we don't get, you mentioned animal control, we don't get all those four hours and, and it's nothing that we can do. It, it's a union issue. They clock in, they drive here, they patrol, and if you know they have animals to take back, then that has to all be within that four hour window. So yes. that's just one of those logistical challenges with contracting. So to, to, to your point, um, when Animal Control gave a presentation to the Public Safety Commission, they did uh, clarify for the commissioners that their clock does not start when they leave the Van Buren location. It starts when they hit East Vale's border. But yes, they are a part-time code enforcer. We only contract for 50% of an officer. So, you know, he's all over the Inland Empire and he tries to put in his five hours, but sometimes he gets called away. Do I think it's the best model? Not necessarily. I think the city would get a lot more bang for their buck if they had a dedicated officer. But with dedicated officer comes an increased uh, cost. Uh, but that does give us dedicated services. Um, I did, at the uh, suggestion of the Public Safety Commission, request a quote from Animal Control for a full-time dedicated officer for just for the council's benefit. Um, our current uh, contract um, minus the license fee credit is valued at $106,000. If you, and that's, and that's for a half-time field officer. You add in, add additional hours to that, that field officer to create a full-time field officer, you're now looking at a $170,000 contract. That's a council decision. Um, if, that's, if that's something that, that council wants to, again, increase your level of services, that's, that's something that we'd, that's gonna come at a cost. I think that we also have uh, an option to also request an audit to see, I think everything's computerized even with uh, animal control, right? They have like a mobile digital terminal inside their vehicle. Mm -hmm. So all, everything gets logged, you know, they hit the 97 button, 98. And um, <clears throat> so we could actually request an audit where somebody actually goes and looks at all the numbers, they pull the logs. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if the Sheriff's Department, you probably do that periodically. I hope. Yeah, actually, uh, specifically to the Sheriff's Department, we track and audit uh, our contract hours and mileage on a daily basis. Uh, that is uh, transferred onto a spreadsheet uh, by one of my lieutenants, and it goes directly to our accounting division, who also keeps tracks and audits it on a daily and weekly basis. And then we have, I have a staff meeting with my lieutenants and contract lieutenants on a weekly basis. And during those meetings, uh, they provide me the information on where we're at, whether or not we're over or under on our contract hours. And we are rarely over, we're typically under, uh, which I don't like either. We should be uh, exactly where we need to be. Uh, but we track that daily, weekly, and then monthly with the invoices. And just to, so it wouldn't be unheard of to see an extra car or two rolling around at certain times of the year because absolutely. you're trying to make up hours that you're short. Absolutely, um, and that's one of our, our continual um, for all for the Christmas. contract cities is trying to provide the hours that we're contracted for 
So at times that we do have additional units uh, throughout the cities, um, we do rotate that those people around so that they can provide the services to make up for those hours. And, and that's exactly what I was referring to, is just making sure that even specifically, yeah, for law enforcement, that when we get towards the end of the month, and I'm glad that you're keeping a, a good watch on that, that when we get towards the end of the month that we realize that, hey, we're down on hours, yes, let's add an extra car, um, just to make sure that we're getting what we're paying for, especially for, for all of us taxpayers that are, that are paying for these services. We want to make sure that we're getting, if we're getting 90 hours a day, that we're getting 90 hours a day rather than 80 hours, 85, whatever it is. So that helps Absolutely. to clarify that. Is there, is there a range that we stay within um, contract compliance? Is, is there anything in our contract set in place that they have to be within 2% plus or minus or, or anything? Or do we just try and always stick towards that 100%? No, we, we try to stick at 100%. Um, like I said, typically we're under. Um, if we're in the neighborhood of, uh, say, 50 hours under, that's based on the percentages, that's probably equal to 100%. Um, so it just depends on uh, where we're at. And like I said, we try to stay at 100% or get to 100%. That's our goal. OK. Thank you. I know, I know this never happens, but if you're over by a couple hours, do we get billed for it? Uh, you do get billed for yeah, it, yes. And that rarely happens, you're right. <laughs> uh, I had a question. The, um, the total um, reserve fund, uh, is, is that plus or minus? Or actually, you might be able to tell me, do we still owe the county any money? Or have we paid that off? We have paid the majority of it. Uh, we will pay all of it by June 30th. So the reserves that you showed us does are, not include does not include that. And I want to uh, point out that reserves does not necessarily equal cash. So our cash balance is a little bit higher than the reserves uh, because we have those obligations or accounts payable or payroll that we need to account for. Right, but I we were we were holding it does not that account in reserves. For it. Okay. Yeah. Councilman Plot, thank you for your presentation. I uh, I have one other question in, in the bar graph that you showed. Um, in this budgeted year, 2016-2017, there's a dip in expenditures for next year. Why, or sorry, for the next following year, why is that if services are going up, why was there a dip in expenditures? And it, it may be because of the other expenditures on the gas tax and those things that were, but I'm just wondering why. Yeah, from basically 2017 to 2018, it takes a slight dip. What was the cause for that dip? That's a good uh, question. Um, as you can see, this 2017 year included the construction of the fire station, which we will not have next year. And that, would be the That's, that accounts for the difference. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Not, not a question. I just and the reason I was kind of harping on the the law enforcement. You know, is I'm, I'm concerned with this potential wave, you know, that we might experience um, with increased property crimes, burglaries, you know, with Prop 57 now, you know, coming out, um, the regulations being issued and, and what's going to be the, the potential upset of that, Prop 47 and AB 109, things of that nature. Um, we're in a difficult situation, but I, I don't want to get caught with our proverbial pants down and and have to to make a rush you know to to be reactive rather than than proactive so um, it, it's hard for me to say you know let's let's pull money from here to um, rob Peter to pay Paul you know do we pull it out of reserves uh, I, I don't know but I think you know I I would like to strongly consider adding those additional 10 hours it's unfortunate and it's also very upsetting because these are one of these you know, state mandated yet unfunded programs that and our state legislator loves to do i had a conversation today with someone on the airport land use commission and it's not a great example but it's another you're going to do this and you're going to find a way to pay for it and that seems to be a common theme and, and that's now on the back of our of our citizens on our financial health um, on a whole bunch of other things and do we sit and, and you know beat our head against a brick wall and yell and complain about it um, or you know do we do we suck it up and, and do something I'm not in favor of, of any new taxes I would be very much opposed to that um, I'm very curious to look at you know this 
uh, these developer, not developer VAC fees, but um, development fees, you know, I have slight concerns about that, but we'll see what, what comes of that. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a cost and a benefit, and appreciate staff, absolutely. I mean, we've always, these budget sessions, and I, I go to a lot of these, you know, are the best in my opinion. It's clear, it's concise. It's, it's user friendly, our, our, our residents understand it. Um, it's formulated in a way that, that's very black and white. Obviously it's our job to create the gray in that situation and, and try to meld the policy with, with the finances. So that's something that I'm very much in favor of looking at um, and, and where we get that money from. I think, you know, I appreciate the, the feedback of my colleagues but uh, it, it's also, you know, in a very unfortunate situation that we're being, we're being put in as well. I, I think the frustrating part is we see these things on the horizon, but we, you know, we need to be very careful and conservative, which staff has done, because we can't jump for them. We see the potential sales tax, but, you know, something may happen. Nothing's, um, nothing's written in stone. Um, part of what concerns me from the VLF perspective, and maybe it's just because I'm a conspiracy nut, but you know, the, the governor is now trying to, to take over the Department of Equalization. Why is, is that you know, effort out there? They're the ones that are gonna distribute our VLF funds. Putting that back in the hands of the Department of Finance scares the holy you know what out of me. But there's only so many things that we can control, and our job is, is to control what we can't control here. So. I'll get off my soapbox. No, I Thank think you. you're you're actually going right up the road. I was uh, considering. I'm glad you. So we're carpooling. Yeah. <laughs> no, I would like to see uh, that uh, a second. I want a separate budget with a 10-hour increase. I think we're. Motor hmm? motor 10 hours, 10 patrol hours. So so we have we have that. It's part of this presentation to okay. add um, to add the 10 hours, um, as stated previously, you're looking at $689,000 for one year. Um, I would recommend that we revisit that in a few months after we have had an opportunity to revisit the franchise fees. And this is not a finalized, so well, we will it does, be. Well, it does need to be finalized by uh, June 28th. And but it can be amended, right? Yes, it can be amended. It can be amended in three months. It can be amended in six months. It be amended um, July 2nd. It could be amended yeah. July 2nd, exactly. Um, uh, or, uh, yeah, if you do a mid-year, I'm not sure what the legal requirement is to adopt the budget by June 30th. We don't get paid. Yeah. Um, it's it's more of a it's it's more of a, a an economic um, uh, accounting to have your budget done by June 30th. Um, technically, legally speaking, though, it's not required to have a budget by June 30th. Um, you have to have a budget. There are some cities that don't have, that haven't had budgets in almost a year. Um, but as as um, Councilman Rush said, it makes it very difficult then to be able to control your expenditures and revenues if you don't. So um, the best approach is to adopt the budget within the time frame, and then <clears throat> as things change, I think as as the city manager indicated that you're going to have a better idea of of some of the revenues or some. Uh, forecasts that may be more uh, definitive, either at mid-year, and then you can revisit can that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then add add those things that you were talking about as part of that. And I, I agree. I mean, public safety is obviously our first and foremost concern in our city. I mean, that's that's our our big concern is public safety. Um, I know that. That and I don't mean to jump the gun for uh, uh, staff comments, but I know that staff is working with the sheriff's department in getting statistics put together. I would like to see if we can maybe bring back those statistics for the last maybe two, three years 
um, just to show us and to have additional proof that this is why we do need those additional hours because I've seen what, what's happening in crime as well as, I don't know, does the Sheriff's de Department have any kind of perspective, future perspective on what these bills are gonna do to crime? Do they anticipate, do they do, they do any kind of forecasting? Well, I know we're obviously gonna go up, but do they do any kind of um, specific forecasting on stuff like this? I, I'm sure they do. Uh, I'm not uh, privy to that right now, but I think uh, we all see that the direction that we're going right now with these propositions and the, uh, the crime increase not only in our jurisdictions but throughout the, the nation. Um, so my, based on my 30 years experience, I think we're gonna see it uh, continue to grow until it levels out. Mm -hmm. And I don't know when that's gonna be. I'd like to see if we could get those statistics that the that staff and the Sheriff's Department are working on, if they can be brought to us just so that we can um, especially show our residents that hey, this is why we are doing this. Our budget's tight, but this is why we are trying to find the dollars somewhere. So, um, Council Member Rigby, um, we are currently working on putting together the spreadsheet of the statistics uh, to cover um, uh, fiscal year, well, calendar year 15, 16, and current year 17. Um, if Council wishes to add 10 hours it's gonna to have to come out of reserves. There is, there is no other place for it to come from prior to June 28th. And that's an ongoing operational expense, which is not typically what you use reserves for. So that, that's why my recommendation is not to do it at this time until we are able to sit down and reevaluate the franchise fees with at minimum your waste haulers to see what that what additional revenue stream could be generated from adjusting their agreements but but are, are we that, looking at a at a 10% bump 20% on the franchise the franchise fees. Yeah. well let me put it to you this way we have one of the lowest franchise fees in Riverside County I think there's, I think how, how long there's, does that process take? Like, how, how long are we looking at? <laughs> just gonna ask. We've been we've been wrestling with this for several months now. Is there any way we can expedite that yes. so that we can kind of? Well, we, we have, have we do have a meeting on uh, Monday mm -hmm. with uh, Councilmember Plot and Councilmember Rigby. Yeah. So we do have good. our first meeting. Then we'll make sure it gets expedited. Yeah, and that that was uh, just to piggyback on what he's asking is the question I have is we're, are we in the same situation we renegotiate the franchise free when do we realize those increased revenues are we still playing you know the same game where we see oh this is going to happen but do we increase the hours or do we wait for the money to come in the franchise fees uh, get paid a little bit Faster than the, they the get paid quarterly, mm -hmm. um, about 30 days after the quarter ends. And that all depends on whether we make that, whatever that we renegotiate, if it's effective immediately, if it's not effective till January 1st. So it has to do with that as well. There will be, yeah, several variables with that. Sorry, Michelle, just on that date, I have it, I have an invite, not that it's relevant, but it is somewhat relevant because it's time pressing. I have the meeting on the 26th. Is it, which is a week from Monday? Okay, it is. Oh, it's the 26th. My okay. apologies. Is that still okay with time? Do we want to oh, shoot no, it no, sooner? No. Uh, well, I think that was based on schedules. Yeah. I can't make this. Um, you make it Monday? I'll make it Monday. But, make but it Monday. again, this we'll is this is it. where yeah. City Council has the discretion to mm -hmm. move forward with the budget <coughs> at this time and bring it back you know, 30 days from now, 60 days from now for a budget adjustment based on new findings or additional data or. I, I'm willing to do that, but uh, I mean, if we come back and the situation's exactly the same, I'm prepared to go into the reserves to bring up our hours. With prop, with the amount of property crimes and the increase, it, it's, it's out of control. So, I mean, we obviously, we don't want to put ourselves in a situation where financially we're hurting ourselves but 
we're also, you know, we have a duty to the citizens to uh, try to remain uh, somewhat safe. Well, and crime, crime is directly related to property values too. I mean, you have, you have an increase in crime, we're gonna see a decrease mm -hmm. in property values, we're gonna see a decrease in property values, decrease in revenues. Yeah. Um, so we have to, so it's a, it's we have to stay a step chain ahead. Reaction. Okay. Councilman Plot. This could be for Michelle or Anna. Did, did we also look at, there's something we're looking at on the finance committee. It was, it had to do with the development, the development impact fees, but also doing a pass through charge for the legal side. We do that for mostly every other aspect of city with the exception of legal where to the development impact fees. Oh, the the two percent upcharge. Yes, that two percent. That's that's one of the areas where we don't charge on the developer side, the fees for, for Mr. Kavanaugh. But we kind of get that back. We I know we're not doing that now, and it might not be. I mean, in, in retrospect, it might not be a lot, but it may be. When we're talking about, hey, that may help pay for ten percent of of the cost. We will look at that as part of a comprehensive user fee study, which is currently under study. But it, it it's not necessarily currently in our current it's not in budget. our current budget no okay but we sh we hope to bring that back um well next meeting we'll we'll propose to to start that study so it should be probably a 30 to 60 day turnaround okay plus um time to uh, adopt and um, i think 60 days after adoption it'll be effective any idea like a ballpark or of what the dollar amount of what that could look like not it hold, won't be hold, enough to cover to. 10 hours. No, I know that. Yeah, I, I assume <laughs> that. No, I know that. But, but you know, something that. Um, I don't have the numbers, but okay. I can get them for you. Okay. All right. I think we've already handled council discussion. Did we have any comment cards? Okay. <laughs> Did you have something? Mayor Pro Tem Laramore. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I would tend to lean towards actually waiting until we have these discussions. Um, I think we all, I absolutely would love to see an increase in hours. It sounds like all of us would. Um, but if we don't have those funds in place, um, the unfun action will be to pull, take hours away down the line. That's not, and that, I know that's something none of us want to do. So I, I would urge going slowly on this, even though I know I, I want to do it, and I know all of you want to do it too. Thank you. Well, I, I would move approval of the uh, um, item with staff's recommendation, and I'd like like it to be brought back and uh, re-agendized in sixty days, ninety days. What do you think? If we could tentatively shoot for sixty days. Okay. And, and as we kind of peel back the onion, um, we may need to adjust that, but I would say 60 to 90 days. But let's How start about with a maximum 60. of 90 days, we'll say. And if you can Not get it back maximum. earlier, come on back. <laughs> okay. So we'll say with a maximum of 90 days to come back and uh, be reheard for an amend for being amended. For Okay, for, uh, for a potential budget amendment. Yes. Okay. So if anybody didn't get that, I, rec I'm, uh, I move approval with staff's recommendation. Second. Um, we do have the CIP presentation from, oh, from Joe. Joe. Unless uh, the mayor or city council member would like to delay yeah. this, I'd be happy to do that too because we have a lot of stuff going on here. That's fine. Would you like to do it now? Would you like to delay this presentation yes. on CIP? And yes. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll move on to uh, item 8.2, selection of the League of California Cities 2017 Annual Conference Delegate and alter Alternate. Uh, yes, good evening, Mayor Tassari and Council Members. The 2017 League of California Cities Annual Conference is scheduled for Wednesday, September 13th through September 15th, 2017 in Sacramento. Uh, the League is requesting every city to designate a voting representative and up to two alternates who will represent the city at the business meeting. Staff's recommendation tonight is to appoint a member of the City Council to serve as the City's delegate and up to two alternates uh, at the League of California Cities Conference. I'd be happy to answer any questions. I would nominate uh, Mayor Pro Tem Laramore to be our delegate. 
Second that, and I would nominate, uh, I know we have to do them separately, uh, Mayor Tassari to be our alternate. Anybody want to be a third? Anybody want to be a third? Councilman Rush, are you open to being a uh, second alternate? That, that's fine. Um, I guess I have a, a procedural question. She's got feedback tonight. If three of us go, we have a s council meeting scheduled for that night as well, right? The 13th? I'm not sure what the agenda is. Usually the yes, first days, correct. there's like a welcome, and I mean, it, it's pomp and circumstance. It's not anything necessary, so. I would also like to add that the council is going dark in August, so that is the first meeting from returning dark. Oh, great. So we would not have a quorum for that night. So that's fine. I mean, if we could work something out where at least three of us could be here that Wednesday. Um, I'll wait till Michelle gets done, sorry. Crystal ball, is there anything that we would anticipate needing a four-fifths vote on on the 13th? Probably haven't thought that far no. ahead, but okay. Take your word September. For okay, then that's fine, and we can work out the logistics. I can be here Wednesday night. Sounds good. Okay. Council Member Plot? Yes. Council Member Rigby? Yes. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Lormore? Aye. Mayor Tassari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. We'll move on to 8.3 Contract Award for Public Storm Drain Project no uh, Zone 2, Project Number 93019. Mr. Bradshaw. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. A couple of questions, if I may. Um, has this company done work in this region before that we know of? Uh, they've done a lot of work in the Nine Desert. Uh, I would assume so. I think we are on all the references and they have Okay. Um, who did the engineer's estimate for the project? Uh, that was, I think, was Anderson. Is it materials costs? Because I'm hearing that materials costs are going up. I'm sure part of it's materials cost. Um, but everybody I talk to, they're, they're saying, you know, they're saying 25, 30 percent increases uh, in labor and, and materials. I think it's more labor than it is materials. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Plot. Uh, out of what funds are we using to pay for it? Is it the Measure A or uh, this gas is tax? One, this is zone two. Thank you. Thank you. Got any public comments? Mayor? Mayor Pro Tem Laramore. Thank you, sir. Um, have we done any work with uh, the
the second one in the list, uh, Boudreaux Pipeline? Uh, we looked at that. If you, uh, if you're close, if they are closer, but if the most responsible bidder is still, you know, we have not been working with Boudreaux. I have been working with Boudreaux before. But uh, we really look forward to the most responsible bidder. I'm sorry, another question. So, what's the plan for our balance of the funds, the 800000 and change. We have, we have 1.9 million allocated with contingency were 1.1. So what are we going to use the balance of the funds for? Uh, the contingency is really for unforeseen items. Uh, it has to do with soils, conditions, or utilities. Yeah, I'm sorry, outside the contingency. May I, we have, may we I answer the question, uh, the question uh, Greg? May I ask a question, uh, Councilman Rush? Uh, the $2 million is a not to exit agreement for a variety of projects, and we have spent about $300,000 or so for Selby Avenue Storm Bin, which was part of this funding. Okay. Okay, that was $300,000, and then this is expected to be like 1.3 by the end of the day with staffing and design. So I would say about $1.6, $1.7 million. So the balance is going to go back to the Zone 2, and we've been working very closely with. Um, uh, Park Control District, and now we are seeking another funding for from the Zone 2 to build the uh, Hamner Avenue line from uh, Sliceman Road all the way to Riverboat uh, on Hamner Avenue, from Sliceman to Riverboat. This those, are, be, those are ADP funds? Um, that's not ADP fund. It's going to co-op agreement uh, through okay. the maintenance project that they have. So in your opinion, is this overage of about 30% going to be significantly cut into any future projects? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. Yes, thunder. <laughs> we'll close the public comments since we don't have any. And I'll entertain a motion. I would move approval. Second. Councilmember Plot? Yes. Councilmember Rigby? Aye. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Lormore? Aye. Mayor Tassari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. All right, move on to item 8.4, extension of the contract services for code enforcement staff augmentation. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Uh, this item is uh, being brought to you um, based on the feedback from the um, Finance Committee uh, to have their desire to have the city return to a two-person code enforcement model. Um, if you recall, the last budget season, um, our second code enforcement officer position had been eliminated for, for budget, budget reasons. And, um, but mid-year, we had some unforeseen demands increase in code enforcement that continue to exist today. And that's a specific in part to uh, maternity tourism, grow houses, et cetera. Um, you have a continuing growth in the city, yet we only have one budgeted position to cover 64,000 residents. Um, again, based on the uh, recommendation of the finance committee, they wanted to have a second position built back into the budget for fiscal year 17-18. Um, the current situation is that our contract uh, code enforcement services, uh, supplemental services that council had authorized back in October of 2016 uh, was extended again in April. Uh, it, is a, it is to expire um, on June 30th of, of this year. Should the council wish to um, move forward with um, the second code enforcement officer position and our contract position terminates on June 30th, it's going to create a situation where we're back to one officer and um, that's going to create a backlog of uh, code enforcement issues and insufficient staffing to address the demands. Um, so I am asking that uh, pending adoption of the budget that the council allow for um, an extension of uh, contract code enforcement services for a 90-day period 
to allow for us to immediately uh, start seeking um, applications. That does not mean that, that we have to actually fill, do a, a full recruitment and fill the position so should the council change their mind and not adopt a budget with a second code enforcement officer. However, um, we want to kind of get ahead of the curve and plan ahead because I do not want to see a gap in services. Uh, this would allow us to, to continue the continuity of services and allow for a period of recruitment should the council adopt a budget with a second code enforcement officer position. Should that not occur, then of course the contract position would expire on June 30th, 2017. None. Anybody? All right, I'll entertain a motion. I move approval. Second. Councilmember Plot? Yes. Councilmember Rigby? Aye. Councilmember Rush? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Lormore? Aye. Mayor Tesari? Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. All right, we'll move on to item 9 city managers and staff reports. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Council Members. As uh, was stated previously, we are working on the statistics from the Sheriff's Department. We have been given several years of data, uh, current year to date, as well as 15 and 16. Um, that is being uh, put into a um, spreadsheet that can be distributed to the public. Um, it does take time to collect some of this data, so um, the Sheriff's Department is, uh, I have made a request for additional years, but at this time we are uh, in possession of uh, 15, 16, and year-to-date 17, and staff is putting together a spreadsheet. Um, we'll add in the other years once that, that data becomes available. Um, but I would like to uh, bring that to the city council uh, members um, for your review before it's distributed publicly. I have a question on that just real quick. Is that just going to be an annual information or is it going to be an ongoing like monthly or quarterly or? Um, it's going to be monthly oh, okay. uh, at the end of the month. Right? Month, month close? Month end close. Yes, these are going to be the uh, UCL reports that have been approved for release by the sheriff. And uh, typically they're a month behind. So I'll be releasing them to the city manager at the end of the month for the previous month. Do we, do we know the content of what the, what's going to tell in the stats, the, spe the specifics or the details of them? We kind of like maybe to see that as well. Yeah, we well we've ha asked for um, based on. Give me one moment. Um, we asked for obviously um, statistics on homicide, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, vehicle theft, arson. Um, and then we did also request some uh, specialty uh, statistics for mailbox theft, um, uh, loud uh, parties. Uh, I believe it was uh, street racing. Street racing, street racing. exactly. Okay. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, Captain Hedge, there isn't a specific vehicle code or a, a call for service code that goes with street racing. And this is why this is difficult for them to extract because they have to actually go through a lot of calls for service that are under the umbrella of uh, what uh, reckless driving. I don't. I don't know. Yeah. As, as of right now, um, actually, in, in researching the uh, street racing violations, we found that those are categorized in a broader uh, violation of exceeding the speed limit or reckless driving or people driving too fast. We don't have a specific code for that. So I'm writing a proposal right now to the Sheriff's Department to have a specific 
Sheriff's Department identification number for that crime, which hopefully will help us identify the problem, not only for Eastville, but throughout the county. So that, that's, that's part of the reason that some of this data does take some time because they have to actually go sift through all of those types of calls for service to determine which ones were actually specific to uh, the, uh, the request, which was street racing or mailbox theft, or, and there were, f there were a few others. And so this data will be uh, presented in a spreadsheet month over month and uh, year over year. If I can just add, the, the way that I'm distributing it to the city manager is a, a spreadsheet, uh, which is the only spreadsheet that was approved by the sheriff for release. And since I'm releasing it to the city manager, uh, she can release it into any type of spreadsheet she, she would like. However, the information I'm providing was the only information that's approved from the sheriff for release and in the format that's approved for release by the sheriff. All right. Does that make sense? <laughs> so we will be putting it into a format based on a sample that was provided by uh, Council Member Rigby and, um, and then Council can sort of Give, give us some feedback on the format before it's uh, published publicly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. City Attorney. Mic drop. <laughs> All right. We'll move to council comments. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Um, last week we had our policy committee meetings. Um, the League of California Cities uh, transportation. That one took place on Friday of last week. So I took a five o'clock flight to get up there for my committee meeting time, which means I had to get up by at three. It was pretty awesome. Um, <laughs> got back at midnight, so it was a really long day. Anyway, um, in, in the committee meetings, w there was um, a number of items discussed, but um, there was one piece of news that I found interesting, and that's in relation to uh, Senate Bill 1 and the funding associated with that uh, for the cities, that the cities will have to uh, comply with audits and also submit information to the state in order to receive um, funding for road improvements within the community, and it has to be um, used and you have to prove that in, I believe, the years 2011, 2012, and 2013 that you spent money in your city on road improvements. So um, I've already relayed this to the city manager earlier this evening. Um, I want to make sure that the state isn't trying to do something funny with those specific years with the new cities and maybe we can get in front of it. Um, so there was that. Uh, also of discussion was Senate Bill 6, I believe it's 39 or 29, uh, but that had to do with um, small cells um, and putting those, what, what it would do, it would bypass city council, um, city councils across the state and have um, cell phone providers go and put up cell phone towers at will, small cell phone towers, attach them to our um, light poles throughout the city or where, really wherever they like and we have no recourse and we will have to accept a monetary agreement reached um, on by the state basically of $4,000 per unit. Um, yeah. So the city of Eastvale has already opposed this but it sailed through the Senate apparently as now in the assembly for a vote of concurrence or bringing, and um, apparently the lobbyists on behalf of this have been at it for the past three years. So they've gotten a lot of their uh, votes already lined up. So um, when I understand that, who, who one of you is gonna be speaking with our assemblywoman? Yes, soon. Actually, Councilman Rush is going to be. Okay, I, I, I have some information to pass along when, when we do that. So okay. that concludes my report. Um, 
Thank you. Councilman Plott. Thank you. Uh, no, no comments for our RT except Todd will be filling in for me uh, next week. I will be out of town. Uh, one quick question: Just wanted to get an update, uh, Joe, if you can, if you please, for the uh, Peach Blossom Road and kind of somebody that maybe if you have anything to share. If it's bring up a next meeting, just kind of wanting an update on that. Yes, uh, Councilman Plot. Uh, we have uh, met with the uh, SU aware. We've met uh, with the uh, two residents. Um, uh, Lieutenant Forbes and myself, and we review their um, complaints and their requests on Peach Blossom. And um, Councilman, I'm sorry, um, Lieutenant Forbes uh, ran the report for the past one year. And uh, according to uh, the report, there's only one reported accident during that period. I understand that um, um, after speaking to you that there may be some other accidents or incidents that were not reported. So um, staff has reviewed these locations, and um, uh, we can uh, we are pleased to um, um, uh, uh, do more investigations and research and uh, analyze the situation and uh, come back with some kind of um, uh, proposals or uh, recommendations at the next meeting. If that is that pleases you, thank you, thank you. I have, I have no further comment. Yes, thank you. Um, the statistics were something that that I was uh, kind of pushing for, so I really appreciate you guys working together and getting those done. That's um, really appreciated. Um, I had just a couple of things. One, uh, just a reminder from uh, Parks Commission, next weekend is Picnic in the Park, um, biggest event in the city. So make sure that you're there. If you're not planning on being there, be there anyways. But also just be, a, be aware of the traffic that it's going to um, bring to the city also um, and then was there any update Joe on the fire station uh, orchard and the progress that's happening there yes sir um, last week we worked with a developer in the area to get about eight loads of um, dirt and what they did is they also uh, voluntarily and helping us to remove uh, uh, five trees in the area that may be in the way of the uh, uh, garden club. And I'm working with uh, Mr. Don Pattinger on, on all this uh, effort, and he's very pleased to find out that we are able to level the hole, um, uh, grade the site. And what we're waiting now, hopefully by tomorrow or Friday, we'll get some kind of a bid or proposal from three landscape contractors. Uh, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do at the main uh, front yard of the fire station, we're trying to beautify that by using um, a drought tolerant land, uh, um, plants, similar to at, the, at, uh, at fire station 31. And during that work, we're going to have a sprinkler across a, a driveway because some of the line have been chewed out by the, by the rodents. So it's, it's all, almost all gone now. So uh, once that happens, we're going to lay a very simple irrigation, and we're going to turn it over to Mr. Paringer, who is going to start working on the, on the orchard. Thank and you. There's some, some progress in that. Please thank you, it. and thank you for following up on that. Thank it's, you. it's interesting how little things like that bring the notoriety to the city um, from outside of the city, that people see little things and they get interested. I mean, as odd as it is, just a little orchard in front of a fire station, but how people outside of the city start to hear about that, news media starts to hear about that, stuff like that. So it's... Yeah, we need the little things make a big difference in our city. We need healthy firefighters, sir, to, to protect the city. <laughs> the last thing that I had was just regarding the, the um, I always butcher this name, the short-term rental ad hoc committee, I think is the name of it, the official name of it. Um, we do have a tentative uh, date. We were waiting on the HOA on some of the things that they were uh, discussing in their recent HOA meeting. So we do have a tentative date of June 21st, subject to the availability, availability of the HOA members. Um, but we are continuing on that. We appreciate all that staff's doing, uh, code enforcement following up on all the, the um, information that they've been given on that. So we are moving forward with that still. Um, we're just waiting on the HOA to confirm a, a specific date. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Councilman Rush. Thank you. Uh, it's budget day, I guess, all day today. RCTC today approved their $1 billion, with a B, dollar budget. Uh, first billion dollar budget, I think, in the commission history. Most of that is associated with the 91 CIP project. For those of you who may have noticed, the uh, 
towering inferno of K rails on the 15. I inquired about that today. Um, they're they're trying to get rid of them, sell them, get them out of there. So, um, working on that. I wanted to ask, and Kathy's here for Eric. I don't think we've done a like general plan report to the council. I think it's in our strategic plan. So I'd like to see an annual report. Yeah, if we could put that not immediate, but if we could put that on the the list long list of to do to do items. Um, my my general interest is is kind of where we are with respect to available parcels, what those parcels are general planned and zoned, where we're looking at, or where we have zoning inconsistencies, um, kind of dovetailing it into our, our bottleneck study, I guess, if you want to call it that, um, and what opportunities there are from a public-private partnership type perspective, rolling into economic development. So it doesn't have to be super fancy or super long. Super fancy. If you want to make it super fancy, that's fine. Um, and then it's Flag Day, so happy Flag Day, everybody. And uh, come out to the picnic in the park. Should be hot. Thank you, sir. Michelle. My apologies. I, I did want to uh, let you know the city will have a booth at Picnic in the Park, so city staff will be working. Please stop by and say hello. Um, also wanted to share with the, the council that um, uh, the shopping center anchored by Smart and Final um, has announced that uh, Smart and Final is planning their soft opening on August 22nd and a grand opening on August 23rd. And I'm working with the developer to, um, you know, have the city and uh, Chamber of Commerce involved in, in those festivities. Um, we have also requested um, uh, through Goodman to do a grand opening for Volkswagen, Audi, and Porsche. Uh, Global Training Center, they're still in the middle of their tenant improvement right now, um, but they're looking at the end of July, early August, so I should have more details for you soon, but just kind of want to put that on your, your radar for now. Um, also would like to advise the council and residents that uh, Silver Lakes, which is not in the city of Eastvale, is holding their a large <laughs> I know many people think it's in the city of Eastvale but it's not uh, across the street um, uh, they're having a large-scale event on uh, July 1st um, that's the weekend after picnic in the park um, the preliminary details that we have been provided um, is that uh, Eastvale Community Park will be closed starting on Monday, uh, the Monday following picnic in the park. So what's that date? The 28th, I believe, 26th? 26th. 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 So it's going to be closed uh, for an undetermined amount of time at this point. The, their estimates were 60 days, 90 days. This was brought up at the Parks Commission meeting last month, but I don't think they had actually given a hard date of closure. Um, it is going to be Monday the 26th um, in order for them to do some rehabilitation on the fields at Eastvale Community Park. During that closure, they are going to be allowing Silver Lakes to utilize the parking at the Eastvale Community Park, so all 800 parking spots, in addition to parking at Eleanor Roosevelt High School. Um, so their event at Silver Lakes will have some impact on the citizens of Eastvale. Um, we, the Sheriff's Department, CAL FIRE, city staff, and Silver Lakes and Norco have been working together for several weeks now to look at their traffic control plan and mitigation measures. Um, we're hoping to minimize the impact to Eastvale residents as much as possible, but I do want to advise the council in case you start to get questions, comments, um, they are advertising their event on KFROG. So it is going to be a large, a large scale event. Um, I think they're advertising it four times a day on KFROG. So it will be a, um, a car show, a country music festival, or country music concert, and a beer, um, 
beer festival, micro brew festival, something. <coughs> like that. Sounds like fun. Um, so um, we're doing our best to uh, mitigate and reduce any negative impact to Eastvale residents, but there's going to be some unavoidable uh, <coughs> impacts because that project is just across the street from our city. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Lastly, we will be doing an announcement through <coughs> the city's website, kind of advising residents, hey, we've got picnic in the park coming up from JCSD. We've got this other event coming up from city of Norco. And so we're just going to start front loading our residents with information about these events and potential impacts and, and uh, maybe areas to <coughs> avoid. And uh, we will also be circulating some maps and, and information about Picnic in the Park specifically because they are going to be closing Citrus like we've done the last few years and shuttling from Eleanor Roosevelt. Councilman Rigby said we haven't gone on long enough. He has a question. I'm sorry. A and my cookie's waiting, so I'm going to be quick. Your cookie? <coughs> my cookie on my. <laughs> oh, not cookie. my. No. <laughs> 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 uh, just to clarify, at the Parks Commission meeting, it was not discussed that the park would be closed. It was not discussed. That was just that just came up on us. Um, JCSD did not let us know about that during the Parks Commission meeting. They did discuss that they had a consultant that was looking at what they could do to the field and that's as far as they got that they were evaluating that and they said that what the consultant recommended was too expensive that they were going to look at what they could do internally and they would bring that back to the commission um, the the other thing with that is is i know staff is doing an excellent job right now being brought up to speed on what's happening at silver lakes for this event i don't know if there's anything that any kind of agreement we can get with the city of norco silver lakes but that we can be brought in earlier um, because this has been very tough on the staff, our staff, and our staff has done an excellent job in being brought back up to speed, but I don't think it's fair to our staff nor our sheriff's department to be thrown, nor our school. I talked to um, Ted Rossi the other day and the same day that Joe emailed him about their request to use the school and he had no idea about it. So it's not fair to us as a city being thrown with this stuff at the last minute when it impacts our city more than it does the city that's actually in. I, I you, would sir. recommend possibly that we have staff draft a letter for our mayor to sign or all the council members to sign indicating our concerns, something that comes directly from us. I, mean, I, I would guess agree. Staff is doing a great job, but maybe we need to up the ante a little bit. Bill them for the hours. Or just, or just don't make our roads available. Block them. Just <laughs> all right. Norco does, Norco does it all the time. You look yeah. at Hidden Valley yeah. and, and where my mother in law lives over by Stagecoach Park, there's two K rails right there on the border. No entrada. Hmm. Um, right. one, one of the things um, I have uh, expressed to uh, JCSD, City of Norco, and Silver Lakes is that I would like to see a stakeholders meeting. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to to shoot for that after this event. Um, I would like that meeting to include two elected officials from each agency so that we can openly discuss the issues and and formulate a more collaborative and cooperative approach moving forward. Like a standard operating procedure or something. Like Correct. From here on out, this is what we do. Correct. Um, that, that's, that's my objective yeah. is to kind of develop some, some sort of framework because this is not going to be the last large scale event at, at Silver Lakes. So, I, and, and there, obviously there's a, an economic development impact to both cities for, for having a, a facility like this and, and I commend them, but there needs to be more cooperation and collaboration on the front end so that we're not caught flat-footed. Vector control will be out Friday. So prepare for the spray. Uh, my meeting, public safety meeting in Sacramento, we had a really small agenda, but uh, one of the items that we voted 22 to 7 to oppose was a state program to uh, start a pilot program for clinics that are basically safe spaces for 
intravenous drug users. So they can bring their dope, they can go to the clinics, and they can get free injections provided by professionals with clean needles. Who were the seven people? They were all from the Bay Area, yes. <laughs> I heard they're giving out free drugs as well. Mm, it's being no, that's the methadone clinic. Okay. That's, that's where they go first. But uh, so anyway, we uh, voted to oppose that. Hopefully the executive committee will follow along. Um, and we had a ring doorbell event at the Bootsma Ranch on Saturday. Hundreds of people. Councilman Rush, Councilman Rigby, they were out there. They saw the lines that went the whole way back to Schleisman. And I installed it myself. Awesome. But uh, $75,000 worth of the equipment they sold. So We heard they're not waterproof also, so yes. be careful. That's right. Do not spray your ring with your hose. They're not toddlerproof either. <laughs> your ring doorbell. But, uh, yeah, any every small step that every individuals or individuals in the city take obviously you know to, to pr protect their own homes helps the entire community so uh, they also want to try and have a booth at the picnic in the park so look for ring out there and East Vail Kiwanis is also going to be raffling off a uh, ring security system for five bucks a raffle ticket and it's got about a six hundred dollar retail value so look for me I'll be selling them and that's all I have. The next meeting is the 28th of June. Be there or be square. Meeting adjourned. So Oscar, you survived, man. Oh. <laughs> hey, you don't, you know, Oscar, you don't have to stay the whole time if you don't want to. It's my cookie.